Welcome to the Wiggly Podcast from the Wiggly Sofa on a Wiggly Thursday. It'll be a Wiggly Monday for you or it could be any other day, I don't know. I'm Heather from Wiggly Wigglers. I'm joined today by... Richard from Wiggly Wigglers. Rachel from Wiggly Wigglers. Woo-hoo! Farmer Phil has gone to sow his seed elsewhere. Really? I don't suppose he... Well, I know for a fact he doesn't do that very often these days. <laughs> <laughs> So poor old Phil has uh, has donned his wellies and he's uh, he's taken to his tractor, has he? uh... Now, you know him better than that. Farmer Mm, Phil doesn't wear wellies. He wears walking, hiking boots. Oh, does he? Yes. He doesn't like wellies. Um, Wellies are not for him. Have you not listened to that podcast? It's the one with the Muddy Matches, the dating agency for people who live in the countryside. No, I don't think I did. I think I missed that one. That was a while ago, wasn't it? It was was a while. I think that was was earlier in the year. I did sign up, actually. (laughs) (laughs) Have you got a Muddy Matches partner? No, yeah. I oh. haven't. Because they're all a bit too country for me. They're all into yeah. hunting Funny and, that. And, and shooting and things. So if anyone out there needs a good young woman, uh, there's one sat on the sofa opposite. <laughs> she'll, she'll, <laughs> nag you, she'll nag you to death, though. So, so oh, be, yeah. be warned. Actually, a, no, so, yeah. don't go for it. It's a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> We were in New York watching a show and there was a beautiful blonde sat next to us in really trendy silk outfit, sort of finishing at her thighs, all dolled up. And Um, do you know what she had on her feet? um, Goat socks. Dr. Martin's. Hunter Black Wellington boots. Really? No. I looked across and I said to Rich, she's got... Well, he's on. Yeah, she's got English wellies on. And there she was, sat, and she was, you know, beautiful. Yeah. And I kept looking at her, and I kept looking at her wellies, and I thought, there's something wrong. <laughs> and anyway, going down the street in New York, we met two more young girls in Hunter Black wellies. Well, there you go, see? That's the corner of the market, aren't they? Yeah. Yeah. Can you uh, imagine their feet in those without some goat socks, though? Oh! oh. <laughs> <laughs> Taking them home after a lovely evening out and then peeling off those hunter wellies. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it wouldn't inspire you to do much toe-sucking, would it, at all? <laughs> Good Lord. <laughs> but did they have mud on them, Hev? No, no, I've never seen a pair of wellies like it. They were shiny black. They're just like you get them out of the box, Mm. just like that. And the hunter thing was all clear, because usually you can't see that, can you? But And the other thing was, her legs were so thin, you know the buckle bit on the top? She'd done it up, totally done it up, and they were still wagging around. Oh, why? You know, mine, Mm. (laughs) there's no way. (laughs) But that could be handy, because you could keep your wallet, couldn't you, and your house keys and things down in your boots. Handy. Handy. They would get warm, too. Listen, on this week's show, (laughs) we've got an interview with Fentagolan, Jeremy. Right. And Jemima, coming up. We've got a Monty Weekly Fact on Wiggliness. Right. And we're going to tell you all about... Opening an Opinel knife. Cool. Again. Again. <laughs> <laughs> but first, I want to talk mushrooms. What sort of what, magic mushrooms? <laughs> <laughs> poisonous mushrooms? Yeah, poisonous mushrooms. There aren't, aren't many of those. They're edible mushrooms, I think, we want to talk about. Yeah, we are. Logs. We're going to talk about mushroom, mushroom logs. logs. Have, you, did you, uh, yeah. did, have you achieved in the world of sprouting mushroom logs? Well, I have. I bought a mushroom log in May and a shiitake mushroom log, which I was really excited about because I don't like the oyster mushrooms because I think they taste a bit like chicken. Okay. And I'm sort of vegetarian. vegetarian. Sort of vegetarian. How would you know? I sort of vegetarian. Because I have eaten meat. You mean sort of vegetarian? Isn't that like fish? fish. I do eat fish. Sort of. Should we get back to the mushroom logs, Richard? (laughs) Oh, I see. Okay. Sorry. There's an opportunity there to pick on you, so I had to take it honestly. (laughs) Do you eat pork sausages? I don't eat sausages. Okay. Just but it. I might be convinced, actually. <laughs> I am. I'm wavering. I am wavering, you know. So anyway, my mushroom log. So I bought this mushroom log, and they come with all these instructions, and the instructions say shock and soak your mushroom log. But I didn't read that as shock and soak. I read it as shock or soak. Okay. And so I decided that 
shocking it was a bit too violent, so I'd only do the soaking option, which, which is you have to soak it in rainwater for 48 hours and very, very cold rainwater to kind of shock it as well. So I did that, and it didn't work. And then I went back a couple of months later and read the instructions again and realised that you had to shock it as well, okay. which is to drop it from a height of two feet, I think it is, read the instructions, onto a stone or a piece of concrete or something, and that is actually the shocking element. But I don't think I like the idea. I thought that maybe sounded a bit too violent, so I didn't do it. But then I read you had to, so I did it again, and I got a mushroom. Well done. <laughs> One mushroom. OK, and have you feasted on it? Uh, I have. It was absolutely delicious. I made gravy with it. But since then, because you have to give it a resting period, I have actually had another three mushrooms. Right. So, so far, I have had four mushrooms from a mushroom log. And they were absolutely, they were really delicious. Yeah. Absolutely delicious. Shiitake mushrooms. Shiitake mushrooms are a tasty mushroom, certainly. Mm. Uh, yeah. Heather Facts. Shiitake mushrooms are high in protein, averaging about 20% of their dry mass low in fat and high in fibre. The mushrooms also provide several groups of vitamins, particularly vitamins that I can't pronounce. <coughs> so I think they are theamine, riboflavin, niacin, biotin and exorbic acid. But of course you'll know that they're really riboflavin, niacin and something else. So there we are. And research is also confirming that shiitake stimulates the human immune systems and the japanese include shiitake in their diet for its robust flavor texture and health giving properties and you did right to put it in gravy because it says they're best cooked slowly and gently soup or stews are ideal and they can be dried and reconstituted for dishes throughout the year and i think this is because ragman's make apple juice they say they're best soaked in um Apple, apple juice. juice. <laughs> ah, there yeah. you go. Uh, but yeah. I have to say, I mean, apart from the initial shocking and soaking, which I did get wrong the first time, they're really low maintenance. Mine is just sat outside the back door where it gets some rain, it's quite cold, and it's just left there. And because it's outside the back door, every time I walk past... Actually, when I say it's the back door, it's my only door. So it could be also <laughs> the front door, but it's at the back of the house. OK. Um, and so then I can see when the mushrooms are growing. Which is it 100% successful? She said, knowing that you're the one that gets the email from folks who say, mine hasn't fruited yet. Yeah, 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 that's right. Yeah, no, these difficult days do tend to be passed over to me in the email <laughs> world. But the, uh, yeah, it's difficult. I was also going to contradict myself in, in that uh, most of the time they're 100% successful. Most <laughs> of the time. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, but, the, but you know, the, the, the harsh reality is that occasionally there will be a couple of logs out of a big batch that we buy that probably won't fruit but by far the majority will fruit. But, of course, it's patience. You know, it's very much a case of patience. And what happens when you shock it is you kind of shatter the mycelium. You know, you, you shock it into, a, into the, the spores, into a state of thinking, God, they've got a fruit because they have to sow their seed, set their seed and, and carry on the next generations and whatnot. So, you see, uh, they will fruit, but it might take four or five years for them to fruit if you don't shock them. So shocking is to get some fruit off them immediately. And Rachel's log will probably go on now it's fruiting for for the next uh, three or four years, possibly even longer. But it'd be reliant on, on you know, climatic influence. So. But you do have to give it a rest. If you don't shock and soak <laughs> it, then you might get one mushroom every now and then. But the idea of shocking and soaking it is that you force it to produce a flurry of mushrooms. Yeah. And then after it's produced a flurry of mushrooms, you have to let it rest for a little while. And then I think you shock it and soak it again. You could do. You could shock it and soak it again. It but, you don't, but you wouldn't have to, really, you know, if, you, if you're just patient with it and wait. You know, you will get mushrooms popping up over a series of years, definitely. Especially if it's in the right place. Don't put it somewhere where it's going to dry out, you know. If you think... I mean, it's just... It's a, it's a sensible thing. A bit of common sense prevails, really. Just put it somewhere where it's going to be relatively moist and protected, protected from drying weather, you know, harsh winds and uh, cute sunshine and all that sort of stuff. It's the kind of conditions that fungus likes to grow in. Because this is what you see in the wild, isn't it? That after it rains, I know that there's whole sort of scientific theories around the cycle of a mushroom, but after it rains, mushrooms tend to come up a few days later, don't they? Oh, yeah. so, well, I mushrooms mean, are essentially just all water, aren't they? I mean, you know, they're sort of 90 
eight percent moisture. That's all they are, you know. It's very tasty water yeah. and it's good in gravy. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Well, it does, I mean, shiitake is a slight exception to it. I mean, puffballs are obviously significantly more moisture than most other types of mushrooms, and then with shiitake on the other end of the scale in terms of moisture content, shiitake are really nice. You know, you say you put them in gravy and whatnot, but previously I've uh, sliced them up thinly and fried them in some uh, in some bacon fat, and it's kind of not exactly the, the best thing for your cholesterol, but equally they're they're tasty and it's a nice meat substitute because they are very high in protein. I had a friend who did some trials, I might mention it before, some trials on uh, trying to feed grass carp in an uh, in intensive farming situation on mushrooms because they are so high in protein, but didn't, I don't think it worked. Oh, I've just been transported back to my childhood and my dad coming home with a big puffball and us slicing it up on the newspaper and then him getting the butter and water, putting it in a big frying pan yeah. and frying it. And you were constantly saying, is it ready yet, Dad? Is it ready yet? Because mushrooms usually take... No time. Yeah. But in my dad's mind, they needed to be cooked for like three quarters of an hour. <laughs> and, that, and now I'm thinking about it, my mouth's watering. Yeah. And I was like, is it ready yet, dad? Yeah. Is it ready de- yet, dad? Because the women of our house didn't like mushrooms. So it was my dad and my treat. Right, right. And then fresh bread that my mum had made and puffball. Right. Wow. Oh. Tasty treat, yeah. Yeah, yeah puffball's really nice. Oh, I love it. I it's... got given a big one this summer, a huge one. You I were going to bring have... half in for me, I know, lady. it went manky, though. Oh. It did go manky beforehand. Is that but silly, it is, it is the downside of puffballs. You do get rather a lot, you know, at, uh, at any one picking. <laughs> it's a huge Huge, thing. bigger than a football. Basically. There's less about now, though. I don't, you don't see them as much as you used to. That's I blame the like. farmers. Oh, it must be Farmer Phil. It, well, it's all down to Farmer I'm Phil. I'm sure it is. <laughs> the nation's lack of football. You're already joking, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I met up with Fentagol and Jeremy and Jemima. Right. What oh, wonderful name. Yes. Though. It is a nice name. At the Nuffield Conference. Jemima works in the marketing department at Fentagolan and Jeremy set it up after his Nuffield scholarship. Right, OK. And so it's Jeremy's business. Uh, yeah, yeah, and it's down in Cornwall, producing all sorts of flowers, all sorts of bulbs. They do bulbs for Eden, don't they, I think? Yes, they do. They do uh, lots of stuff for the Eden Project. And also our veggie plants, which was your idea, I think, Rich. No, I, mean, I don't think it was my idea. I think it was, it was a process that I, I sort of went through in the main with Jeremy to see which selections, which packs might best suit the Wiggly clientele. Yes, yeah, we've yeah. had a brilliant time producing raised beds and vegetable packs, but we'd actually uh, been a bit over keen on the Overzealous, yeah. Some of, the, some of those packs you could plant a large allotment with. And of course, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> lots of people didn't want that kind of quantity, but people bought them, certainly. Um, I mean, I, we planted up some of our lovely raised beds in the garden here, uh, which Michael uh, did some stunning photography for and put into the catalogue and I think on the website as well. And they're doing really well. And you've been eating some of dodgy kale and things like that, haven't you? I have, that? but what I need is labels because I don't know what the stuff is. Right. So That's I go true. out and it looks sort of big and I think, oh, I don't know what it is. So I sort of chop it up and boil it and hope that that's what's supposed to have happened. Yeah. But yeah. Heather, haven't we got some wonderful beach and cedar labels that you could use in the raised beds? <laughs> well, that'd be fine if I knew what they were. You just tell Hannah to do it. Just ask <laughs> Hannah. I'll do it. I'll do it for you. Because I identified, what was that? I did your luggage. Your yes. luggage that you were drying as parsley. Yeah, leave it. Leave it. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's, we should it's be It's a difficult that. one. Oh, yeah. I, sh- I shouldn't laugh. You know, some of, some of the old Herbie ID <laughs> stuff is a, is a bit of a trick, for sure. But love Look, it is I wonderful. Vi- I haven't sorted birds yet, so there's no hope of vegetables. But I tell you what, Ricardo, uh-huh. my bird feeder on my window is a complete Success. joy. Oh, the, the, I've got the, uh, a wren coming. It's got you're down, having your tea, oh, yeah, you know, or yeah. you're having your breakfast, and a little wren comes. And Michael's seen this. Uh, uh, he saw a blue tit. And it comes, and it just comes in there. You can see them really up close. It's brilliant. And you can't have that one back. No. I know it's a sample, but it can't <laughs> leave that window. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, where were we? Fentagolan is here! Right, we're here in a very, very nice hotel that's gift-wrapped. Well, actually, it's covered in tarpaulin. And I'm at the Nuffield Conference. We've just finished, so we're all, like, having a beer, dear listener. And so I've got with me Jemima and Jeremy. Now, you will love to hear about these two 
dear listener, because they are the suppliers of our veggie plants. And I know you love them. But the most amazing thing is that Jemima is Ellis's wife. And Ellis was on my scholarship year with me. And you'll have all heard about my scholarship year, so welcome to the show. Thanks, Helen. Nice to see you in person. <laughs> and you. So we met last year, and you said to me, we've got these amazing veggies that could be really good for the wiggly listeners. Didn't you? We certainly did, yeah. Um, I've been working with Fentagola now for just over a year, and the Hosking family. And we stumbled across Jeremy. Ellis has been working here for many years, and he's a bit of an expert in propagating seeds into little plants and lots and lots and lots of farmers around Cornwall benefit from his plants and they grow many many thousands of cauliflowers and lots of other different things and it's just a great opportunity really to, to get these little plants into people's gardens and so are you a farmer yourself no I'm not because I know Ellis is obsessed with cabbages he is he has a small cabbage cauliflower flowers. fetish and I tell you, <laughs> and I tell you our house is never short of a few collies if you're ever in the area it's collie cheese collie soup you name it we're eating it is um, it called Brassica House. Oh, it should be actually, shouldn't it? We need to, we need to do something about that. Yeah, but actually, um, we don't really have much of veg patch ourselves, so we tend to borrow other people's fields for our brassica. So, are you a marketing whiz kid? No, I'm not a marketing whiz kid at all. But I've been doing it for a little while. In fact, as I see your face dropping out of my chart issue in marketing magazine every week, sponsored by Google. That's a nice little cunning one. That one is. Sorry. <laughs> Makes me smile every time I see it. Yeah, sorry about that. All right then. So, Jeremy, you're a Nuffield Scholar. That's correct. When did you do your study? I did my study in 2001. Right. And presented in 2002. And what was it about? Well, I was learning how to grow these veggie plants. I just started raising plants in quite a big way for the Cornish, really the Cornish growers. And I wanted to go around the world and see how it was done on large scale and see how I could apply that for my, to my own business. And what was the impact? The impact was, well, I, I think it was phenomenal, really. I think when I went on my Nuffield, I was growing about 30 million plants a year. Last year, we grew 130 million plants a year. So we, we've gone out and we've changed our systems, really, to how to the big sort of, system, sort of way of growing plants in America and Australia. And that's what we do now. 130 million plants a year. And I've got this picture in my mind of a few raised beds down in Cornwall. Well, the stupid thing is that I love my gardening, and yeah. really I think this is how this has all come about, because people think I'm absolutely mad. We raise 130 million plants a year, and then I go home 9 o'clock at night, and I'm out digging my garden to put no in ten, 10 of this, and I promise you that's true. <laughs> I have 10 of this and 10 of that. <laughs> really? Yeah, I do. And, um, and then we get 130 million plants a year. is actually basically two things. It's cauliflowers and cabbages. And a few years ago, we got rather bored of growing millions and millions and millions of the same of the same thing. So we started doing courgettes and onions and leeks and herbs, and and that's really grown. And we're we're going to be doing even more. And it, at Fenton Gollum, we actually do things. My father did as well. We we've always done things that we like doing. He loves strawberries, so he did pick your own strawberries. We love gardening, so now we've we've sort of started veg. So I know Wigglies have a few hundred. So where does the rest of the hundred and thirty million, the hundred and twenty nine million nine hundred and eighty seven thousand six hundred and twenty two plants go? Right. One of our larger customers will be Riverford up in Devon. Yep. So um, for the, the organic box box scheme. So their farmers would plant those little plants. That's correct. Grow them into veg. They would plant them out in fields. We supply the, the plants in trays and they would plant them out in the fields at eighteen inches uh, apart and then produce the, the finished cauliflower or cabbage or whatever where why wouldn't they just plant seeds well partly the, the seeds are now very very expensive we when we started um producing or oh, 20 years ago the seeds were very cheap it was open pollinated seed and you'd get a kilo of seeds for you know a few hundred pounds yeah seed now is really it's hybrid and it's very very expensive and 10,000 seeds which were fit in the palm of your hand is about 180 pounds so you need specialist greenhouses or tunnels and specialist irrigation equipment specialist seeding equipment and we actually we have a, a phenomenal seed we actually have two or three different seeding lines now we I started off a few um, when, when we started and I had girls picking out the seeds and putting them into trays one at a time and and now we have a machine that will do 800 trays an hour so three so that's 240,000 seeds an hour Good so, and, it, and that, that'll fill the tray, it'll dip the hole, put the seed in, 
cover them over, water them and stack them up. Gosh, and then so are they in a greenhouse? We'll germinate them in a barn. We, they're all stacked into big pallets, shrink-wrapped, yep. where they germinate and they're left there for three days to, to germinate and it depends on the weather. It might be more in the winter and yep. less in the summer. They then go into the greenhouses and the winter plants will stay there all the time but anything in the summer we aim to harden off outside and we feel that's our, our sort of big selling point is that we produce a, a plant that will survive in the toughest Cornish conditions and Cornish conditions can be very tough we get some very salty sea airs we get cloddy soils dry you know drought wet conditions and these plants because they're hardened will survive anywhere so we feel that if they'll survive in Cornwall in the, in the hardest conditions then they'll survive in people's gardens. So, are you a Kelly's ice cream addict then? No, I'm a uh, Cholestic ice cream addict. Really? Yes, yeah, it's a cor- <laughs> Cornish ice cream. Yes. Um, now then, so I've, I've got this scene in my mind now that we're on the sort of Cornish edge of the sea mm-hmm. and there is Jeremy with his greenhouses... That's yeah. We are near. We're actually um, the farm is sort of nestled between. We're, we're about six miles from Truro, and yeah. we actually run down to the banks of the River Fowl. Right. Beautiful area. It's a lovely farm. We're, we actually farm on the Tregothman Estate. We're tenant tenant farmers, and the farm has been in our our family since 1883, and we are the fourth fourth generation. So you've got the hang of it. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, what about the environmental impact of this? Because I'm quite sure that in my mind, I'd imagined a sort of cosy, sweet operation, and it sounds like you're a factory. What about the environmental impact of this massive business? A part of what we do is organic. We actually grow as organically as we possibly can and that for us means as few chemicals as we can and the one thing so one thing that we do is we cover i mean if if they're grown in the tunnels that's fine if they're grown outside we actually sheet the plants over with an enviromesh which actually stops the bugs coming in and also if if plants are grown outside our main scourge uh, disease is downy mildew for cauliflower seedlings and if they're grown outside that actually reduces the effect with regard to water that we've been talking about today we we have very specialist gantry equipment that move down the beds and they spray just exactly the amount of feed or water that the plants want so there's no no wastage there it's a very efficient means of applying the water now i know that your plants are corkers because in my garden i have three raised beds full of them and I also know that we supplied them in big packs and folks soon told us they need them in smaller packs. Mm. But why do you think your plants are good? Now, try not to be biased. <laughs> <laughs> Our plant... Well, I think, as I said, they, right, number one, we're using the best varieties. Um, we're, we're using the varieties that the Cornish growers want and we know they're tried, they're tried and tested and if they're good enough for the Cornish growers then they're good enough for gardeners and I have to say this is one of our biggest I think our biggest selling points because I've always been amazed going around garden centres and looking at the sort of varieties that are offered to gardeners and quite often these are varieties that we would have grown 20 years ago there are much better varieties and there are tasting trials that have been done to actually choose a really good good tasting veg so we're using the best varieties they're hardened plants as I've already said so they they have the best chance to, to grow and I try and I test them myself I have my own this year we really just so that I could take photos I planted up um, window troughs and hanging baskets with strawberries and tomatoes and troughs with herbs and I had them outside my back door and then I suddenly found out that it was a really good idea so I've actually sold the I sold it to myself because we now have raised beds I'm actually giving up my I'm a bit embarrassed of my garden it's um, on the farm I plant it in April and then we get so busy with the plants I never really do anything till August and the whole that place is overgrown with weeds so actually we are moving over to well I am moving over to a raised bed system outside the kitchen window so I haven't got to walk too far. Fantastic. So we've now got the plants and they've arrived at our house. Mm -hmm. How easy is it to actually deal with them? Because, you know, I am a non-gardener myself Mm -hmm. and so I find seeds and things really, really quite mind-boggling. By the time I've decided what compost I'm going to use, whether or not I'm Mm. going to do it indoors, how am I going to... Mm. You know, I haven't done it. Mm. So the plants were a real revolution for yeah, me. And this, what, this what's is, the point? You know, how well, this is the, the, we've actually over the last few years been trialling an environmental packaging. This actually allows the, the plants to breathe 
and what we found is that once we've packaged the plants we package them at a certain moisture level and they can actually providing they've got some light and that's not direct sunlight but if they if you just sort of leave them in a, a light room they can actually last well we say for a week but actually we've trialed for we've trialed for two weeks and i have to say i had some strawberries which i was actually growing in this packaging in the office and we had them in there for five weeks and they were still and i think the, the proof for me is that when it goes into this packaging you can actually still see the plant producing roots so it actually it's a bit like just being in a being in a greenhouse and the, the plant is still actively growing and it's been a real revelation for us because it actually means that you've got a very perishable product and they can arrive say midweek and then so, as i say so long as they're taken out of the box they don't like the dark out of the box and just left in light not sunlight just on a on a table just in a in a light farm then they can be planted that weekend and if the weather's not quite right that weekend then they could be planted the following weekend but to be safe we, we say a week excellent yeah. and then it's literally a case of sticking them out and yeah stick them stick them in and they will they will grow there are obviously little nasties like bugs and slugs oh, and slugs pigeons and bugs. yeah but, and rabbits and, and i have to say they become our biggest customers because it's amazing how many people have to come back to us uh, <laughs> <laughs> so dear wiggly so, customer so, if you, your plants have been eaten by a rabbit you know where to come what was the sort of ice cream that we should eat um cholestic ice cream cholestic it's ice um, cream. it's a local local company in cornwall and the ice cream is fantastic Fantastic. It's and it's better than Kelly's in Lou. We think it is much better. Yes, it is really good. We yeah. will try yeah. it. And we yeah. will come down to Jer- Jeremy's farm at some point later and get in amongst his plants. Excellent. And thank yeah. you, Jemima. Mm-hmm. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you very much. Now, Rich, it's the moment to sit down by the fire, open the veggie seed catalogues yeah. and decide, isn't it? It is. what you want to grow if you're not going to use plug plants. It is. I think uh, most of our catalogues have landed now, haven't they? And yeah. Uh, yeah, definitely. It's a good time to choose your seed. And because I, I talk, February, March is just around the corner, really. I mean, I like to think that so as I can get rid of the <laughs> winter. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> which I, and, I despair and of. But, over yeah, Christmas, yeah, sure. Like yeah, yeah. Oh, and the maudlin Christmas spirit. So it's good to, yeah, to plan and get I your seed through. I was just going and, to uh, come on to the importance of buying your loved one's wiggly gift. <laughs> yeah, well, that's, that, is, that is important. Yeah, that's that's important. Yeah, that, is, that is very important. Yes, practical um, gifts from but, Wiggly uh, Wiggly. But, going, but to, we're going back to the seed. <laughs> <laughs> we're talking about the, yeah, it's a good time to get seed and spadiators as well, you know, get to get your potatoes. If, you know, if you've got polytunnels and things like that, you can put a lot of stuff in the ground now already. But certainly outside, you know, your garlic bulbs need to be going in. I think uh, Terry puts them in at Halloween, but I tend to put mine in around about Christmas time. Well, um, which seems, seems to be. It's it's odd, you know. It's warmer here. Uh, I think well, Herefordshire's ideal for growing anyway, isn't it? Because we're protected by Black Mountains and whatnot. Um, but it is definitely warmer here than it is down in South Wales. And and you'd think geographically, I mean, his his area, his his allotment sits much closer to the coast, and it would have that kind of nice warm wafts of of, uh, of the Gulf Stream. But you know, he's definitely working in cooler climes. You still sprouting? Young I'm sprouting Rachel. all the time. I've got mung beans sprouting in the kitchen. Yeah, love it. I haven't done it for ages now. I mean, it's very good for you, isn't it? You know, mm. sprouting seeds, incredibly good for you. I mean, you wouldn't, it's... looking at you, you wouldn't think so. <laughs> <laughs> What's he trying to say? Yeah? But I don't know. What's he trying to say? The <laughs> word sprout is a perfect word. I get lots of them. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, <laughs> uh, let's go to a Monty cast. A weekly fact on a wiggliness. Monty cast. A weekly fact on wiggliness. Bakashi is the Japanese word for fermented organic matter. Another Monty cast. A weekly fact on wiggliness. Next week. Latest note from Roz Savage. My friend and I were watching a couple of your videos and listening to your podcast tonight. We've decided that Farmer Phil is a legend and we've renamed your company the Giggly Gigglers. Brilliant stuff. (laughs) (laughs) I don't know where she gets that from. Giggly Giggly Gigglers, Gigglers, do you? Now listen, Rich and Rach, you've got to go to the website because Michelle has been working on it and there's two fan dubby dozy new features. What's hot? Which is what we've sold... In the last seven days. Right. And then tomorrow it'll be what we sold in the previous seven days to the seven days after that. And okay. so on. So, so kind of what's hot and what's not? What's, what's not hot 
isn't on what hot <laughs> because that wouldn't be hot. No. And also, deal of the day. This is my favourite. So, <laughs> have you got it? Are you yeah, with yeah, me? Yeah, totally. Deal of the day you can subscribe to. So, you can bring it into your RSS feeds and it'll come up with some amazing something or other today. So, today we had Jekka McVicker's book, several of them, I believe, and they've all gone. So, you have to be quick if but, you want deal of the day. Well, our listeners know what an RSS feed is. Because I struggle. Well, obviously you tech. struggle. I struggle. But of course they'll know. Um, okay. <laughs> just <laughs> click on the uh, wiggly orange button to the right and somehow it will land into your toolbar at the top usually. You'll find out. Put RSS feed into Google or just click on the bottom. It'll all come clear in about three and a half years. Before we go, you know the episodes of opening the Oppenell knife within 10 seconds. Yep. He challenged young Podchef to come up with how to do it. Right. And he has come back rocking. And if you go to gastrocasttv.com slash blog, or better still, put Podchef into YouTube, you will find a fantastic video of Podchef opening an Oppenell knife within 10 seconds. And... He can do it. That's very good. Yeah. It's a cracking little video. Mm. Well worth watching. Yeah. Heather, well do done. we need to mention about opening up an L saws as well? Because we had some difficulty with up an L saws. Go on, Rachel. Well, Spill the beans. I'm not sure whether our customers' problems actually came from buying up an L saws. Basically, like an up an L knife, but a bit bigger with a jaggedy edge, rather than buying normal up an L knives. Because we had a whole batch of these in and we couldn't get them open at all. And so San actually sent the whole batch back to the company we get them from and then received a little note from them saying that you had to tap it on the end, like tap it. Now, I'm not sure which end you tap it. I suppose you try both ends, really, don't you? It's like a chocolate orange. Yes, tap it on a table or something and it unclicks in some way and then you can open it more easily. So they sent them all back to us and said... They're not dodgy, you just don't know how to open them. Tap and unwrap. Tap and unwrap. Mm. Um, Podchef's favourite up and out is by far the number eight. Right. So we will talk to you all next week if you're still there and listening. It's bye from me on the weekly sofa on a fairly cold November day with Farmer Phil busy planting his crops. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.